Welcome back to the Living Jewishly podcast, the Halacha Review. Today's simon, today's chapter that we will conquer, hopefully, is cleanliness when engaging in sacred matters, the cleanliness of focus. We all know and understand that it is impossible to focus when you have things on your mind. It's impossible to focus when external disruptions are there. So the Torah commands us to be completely clean at all times. It's important. Cleanliness is a Jewish value. To be clean, one should involve themselves in holy endeavors like Shema, whenever we're going to mention throughout this class of holy endeavors, it's referring to reciting the Shema, saying other prayers or Torah study. They should only be engaged in a place that is clean. If a place has a bad odor, revealed excrement, or immodesty, one should not engage in any holy endeavors. It is forbidden to contemplate or think thoughts or ideas of holiness and Torah study in a place where excrement or urine are revealed. This restriction changes if the excrement is covered, and if it's covered by snow, it is also considered covered. And urine is diluted with a revius, which is between 2.9 and 5.1 fluid ounces of water. So if these are present, one cannot immerse themselves in Torah study, in prayer, in reciting the Shema or Amidah. If urine is on a garment or ground, water should be poured on it to dilute it. If a person has any excrement on their body, even if covered by clothes, it is prohibited to be involved in matters of holiness. The only exception to this, if one is suffering with hemorrhoids, um, then the medical condition that they're dealing with is um, an exception to that rule. Wherever one prays, they should ensure that the area around them is clean of all filth or odors before praying and nothing dirty like excrement should should be present, even if there's no odor. Now, this is particularly important, not in a typical synagogue. Usually synagogues have bathrooms in a separate area. But what's if you're out camping and you're out in the forest and you get a minion together and then suddenly you realize that there's some excrement on the floor or there's it, it's not necessarily from human could be from an animal. So we'll, we'll talk about those in a second. One must remove or stay distant from urine or excrement of a baby that has begun to eat of the five grains, and those are wheat, barley, rye, oats, and spelt. And some opinions maintain that this applies even if a baby is over eight days old. It is best to be stringent with this. Halachically and practically, we consider a baby's bowels and a baby's uh, urine only to be limiting to prayer after they've already come to the age where most children have already started to eat the, of the five grains like wheat, barley, rye, oats, and spelt. If they didn't, the odor is less pungent and it is not as disturbing for one to pray. The idea here behind all of this, and some of this is like, really, the rabbis actually write this? Yes, because it's important for us to always be clean. It's a, it's a commandment in the Torah to always be clean in our service of Hashem particularly. We have to be extra careful to ensure that not only we are physically clean, but the area around us is conducive to us mentioning the name of Hashem and connecting with God. Excrement of a human or a cat or chicken needs distancing even if no odor is present. Excrement of an animal, a beast, or a bird generally don't emit odor and need no distancing. Anything that emits a foul odor, a carcass, a chicken coop, a sewage, uh, steeping waters for soaking flax or hemp, one must distance as he would from excrement. Dry excrement that crumbles is considered like any earth as long as there is no odor. While praying, the proper distance for any of these foul odors is eight feet. 
However, if the excrement is in front of the person who is praying, then distancing eight feet doesn't help. It's right in front of you. See, you go 20 feet, it's still right in front of you. So one should rather turn to the side and not pray facing it. Members of a minion cannot either be in the radius of the foul odors. So if, let's say you have a minion and the guy in the back is in the perimeter of something which has a foul odor, he can't recite Amen. He can't listen to the repetition of the Amidah from the Chazan, from the leader of the minion. So it's the whole minion needs to be in an area that is clean and devoid of foul odors. If someone prayed in a place where it would be expected for uncleanliness and later realized that he was negligent and didn't look that there was excrement around him, since the Amidah is a replacement for the offerings, he must repeat the Amidah and even the Shema, which is a biblical commandment. He has to repeat. One must wait till the odor of flatulence dissipates before involving in holy endeavors. Torah learning, however, may resume if the smell was from another person. One must distance themselves from any and all forms of bathroom, with or without a bad smell, and close the door to separate from the area even if there is no smell. This is actually interesting that the halacha would bring the following halacha, which is, since a pig's mouth is always rummaging in dirty things, even if it was washed up from the river. So now it's been washed through, right? So it's been cleaned with all that water. It must be distanced before holy endeavors are done with it nearby. So if it washes up from the river, it's still considered dirty because it's always dirty. One should not talk in a restroom or bathhouse. This is also an idea of cleanliness. One should not talk in the restroom or bathhouse certainly not pursue holy endeavors there or any unclean place. One shouldn't say any of God's names in Hebrew or in any other language. One shouldn't either say the word God in English in the bathroom. One should not greet his fellow with a friendly shalom, as that's God's name, that's Hashem's name. If the person's name is shalom, some opinions say that it's okay, but it should be avoided. One is forbidden to learn Torah or pursue holy endeavors opposite erva. Erva is the private parts of the body. There's one exception to that, and that is a baby at the bris. One can recite a blessing right before performing the bris in front of erva, the uncovered part of the baby. Parts of a woman's body, and this is referring to women of all ages, that are usually covered, when uncovered, are considered erva as well. Above the elbows, above the knees, or the revealed here of a married woman. And therefore, prayers or Torah study cannot be done opposite erva. The voice of a woman, as in when a woman sings, is also considered to be something which is attractive and distracting from one's pursuit of holiness, it's considered erva as well. But if unavoidable, one can engage in holy endeavors. So what's if you're next door to a church and you're trying to pray and you hear the choir singing, you hear the women singing, right? What are you going to do? First, you, it's a good idea to move. But if you're not able to move, then you know what you could do? Just pray and ignore it if it's unavoidable. A man should ensure that he has something separating between his heart and his lower organs Anything like a belt or elastic band suffices. If nothing is available to serve as a barrier, one should place their hands to separate between his heart and his erva. Some people use a designated gartel, which is a designated belt, as a separation during prayer times. Uh, it's an important thing our sages talk in, to great lengths about one keeping their hands above their waist and not putting it below their waist. We mentioned last week that a person, a man, should be particular not to physically touch their erva. Additionally, we mentioned previously that you shouldn't say God's names, and that shalom, hello, is also God's name. So very interesting 
that the word shalom means multiple things. It means God's name, but it also means hello. It also means peace. So what when we are greeting someone, what is it that we're greeting them with? Our sages tell us we're greeting them with all of them, but one more. Shalom also means complete. When we greet someone, we say shalom, what we're saying, we're giving them a blessing. God's name should be upon you. You should have peace. And additionally, you should find perfection in your life. You should use shalom. You should find that perfection in your day-to-day life. Make it meaningful. Hashem should bless us all that our lives should be filled with complete blessing. Today, the day of Thanksgiving in the United States, is a day where we stop and acknowledge just like we do every other day of the year. And we say, Modeh Ani, thank you, Hashem. It's not a joke when we say, yeah, every day we celebrate the Thanksgiving. No, it really is. Every day we start our day by saying, thank you, Hashem. Recognizing and appreciating the tremendous gifts that the Almighty bestows upon us every single day. Hashem should bless us that we should use every opportunity that comes our way as a tool to get closer to Him. Amen.